Cool. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me, guys. It's, uh, it's quite a cozy setting. It's almost like uh, being in somebody's uh, living room, only then with 150 people. So it's uh, great to be here. And before I even introduce myself, I want to um, share with you a little bit of an anecdote. Um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was working in an organization uh, helping them improve on their uh, Scrum processes and their software quality. My mind to go hand in hand. Um, and I realized um, something wasn't quite right. The Scrum processes were, were, were getting up to speed, but something wasn't quite right. There was a lot of frustration in that team. Um, so I started to dig into that. I started a few interviews with a few different people. And what came out of that was actually quite extraordinary. Um, I realized that all the people in that organization had lots and lots of great ideas on how to improve the organization and how to improve their own work environment, but they had no way of expressing that. And I remember one guy in particular, he, um, he just joined a couple of months prior, and he said uh, he was so frustrated he was about to leave. He just joined that company, he was about to leave again. And we, we looked at all the ideas he had, and, and, and piece by piece there were great ideas that would help him and the organization as well, but he had no way to process them. There was always like a management layer in the way, or he didn't have the mandate to act upon it. Um, so what I did with all that information, I proposed to implement Holacracy, which was fairly new to myself as well at that stage. We moved ahead, go ahead a couple of months. Uh, it was literally four or five months. I had the interviews again with all these people, and this guy came back to him. Uh, what he had done in that time was move from a job he didn't like, moved it to four or five roles he loved. So he reshaped his own uh, reality within the organization, but all within the purpose of that organization. So not only did he create an, a reality for himself that he loved working in, he also helped to further the organization to get closer to what that organization actually needed. Well, with that setting, um, that's a promise I think everybody would love. And with that setting, I want to dive into, OK, uh, how did Holacracy do that? And uh, just one, one note of warning, uh, that story is not the case for everybody. Some, most of the times, it takes a little bit longer than a couple of months to get there. But in the long run, you will get there. And every, every organization can achieve that. So then let's move to introducing myself. Um, I'm not going to introduce myself like this. This is usually how I would introduce myself. Joost, I'm a Holacracy coach at Energized, and I'm uh, a co-founder at Unomo.com and a co-founder at Nestor.io. Um, I'm going to do it like this. Still Yoast, but I have a couple of core values that are important to me as a person. What do I care for? For me, that's empathy, fairness, transparency, purpose. These are not the only things um, that I care for, um, but they're pretty, pretty important. What do I do with these values? I express them in different purposes. One of them is work liberated. It's the purpose of energize.org. The strategy in expressing that purpose is consultancy, holacracy implementation. I fill one role in that organization. Visible and real-time quality financial scope insight for everyone within the organization. The purpose of Unomo.com, a company I founded a couple of years ago, um, the strategy in expressing that purpose is software as a service. We build software and we uh, provide that to our customers. Time tracking, project tracking, budgets, all that sort of stuff. The last um, purpose on this list is every organization purpose driven through self organization. Um, I know, you've got to set the, set the bar high, right? Uh, that's the purpose for Nestor.io. Um, again, the strategy in expressing that purpose is uh, software as a service. So we facilitate that process for organizations to become purpose-driven. And why is it important? Why do I find it important to, to shift that idea on how to talk about people in organizations? Because you need a massive paradigm shift from uh, like splitting people from the organizations. Because they are really intertwined in our realities. And that's cause of a lot of issues that um, are in the way of achieving the purpose of the organization. So holacracy is, in that sense, a way of achieving that. Um, it's an operating system to help organizations become purpose-driven through self-organization. But often the reaction I get is, hola what? <laughs> um, so let me do a bit of a, bit of a test, a, a show of hands. How many of you knew of holacracy before today? 
Nice, I like that, I'll, I like the crowd. Um, how many of you had know of an organization actually using Holacracy today? A few still, nice, exciting. How many of you have worked in or are working in a Holacracy organization? <laughs> I love seeing a hand, that's, that's very, fairly uncommon. We need to talk. <laughs> nice, love it, I love it. Um, it's very common though. It's very common that that, that gradation really goes to pretty much uh, the, the, the zero line at the bottom. And that's not because Holacracy isn't growing. It's actually growing exponentially. But we're really at the early stages. I, I don't know the, the exact numbers, but I think it's about 1,000 or 1,500 companies worldwide doing it. Um, and there's maybe 50, 60 coaches facilitating that. So it's, it's, it's early days. And with that in mind, it's like really bloody exciting to see so many of you here interested in that process moving forward. So if you ask me to describe what Holacracy is in one sentence, it's always a bit of a struggle to really say, to really nail it down. And I've found um, that this way actually kind of helps to ensure that every action that happens within an organization directly contributes to the purpose of that organization. It's quite clear. You know, that's the goal. As simple as that. And anything that happens outside of that, realign, make sure you get to that purpose of the organization. There's a lot, about, a lot of talk about purpose. And that's quite important, uh, actually, to me personally, because for me, holacracy and even self-organization, they're a means to an end. They're um, there to achieve purpose. They're not there for themselves. They really serve uh, the idea of achieving purpose. So let's, let's dive into what does it mean to be purpose-driven? What, what, what is that? Um, and every organization starts purpose-driven. There's no way you can start an organization without an epiphany of some sort. That epiphany of every founder of an organization, that's purpose. You know, that's the, the idea you started with. And maybe it's not so clear why it started in the first place. Um, but there is that epiphany. Uh, over time, in organizations, you find that maybe it gets lost a little bit. But the other thing is also true. Even if that purpose is not explicit, there's always an implicit purpose. There's always a goal an organization is working towards. But the trick of impurpose, uh, sorry, implicit purpose, or the, the trickiness of that, is that um, it's not so much a point on the horizon to aim for, hence these little boats. It's a range on the horizon. And everybody kind of has their own interpretation. And the other thing, um, in implicit purpose, profit and growth become um, really key. Like they become the goal in themselves. They're really important variables, don't get me wrong. You really need profit and growth. And actually think purpose-driven organizations have a better chance on increasing that properly. But they need to be variables to achieve purpose. And if they're the end goal in themselves, let's make that explicit as well. That is the purpose, cool. That's what everybody comes to work for uh, to achieve. Now the, the, the challenge obviously is how do you take purpose, that point on the horizon we're all aiming for, and translate that, translate that into everyday work? So that that actually means something when you sit at your desk and actually decide what to do, <laughs> what email to send, or whatever it is you might do. Um, and Luxury has a rule set for that, and, and it really dives deep onto self-organization, and that's obviously not something uh, new for most of you. And I like this analogy of the boats. Like each of these individual boats, they're self-organizing. You know, they decide who does what on that boat, and they decide what course to plot. But if you don't have a binding factor, they will all end up in their own little beach, uh, enjoying themselves. You know, they are there for themselves. So there needs to be a way for self-organization to align and to focus on that one point on the horizon. And that's what purpose does, and Holoxer gives you a rule set to achieve that. Um, also, like, like this one. The purpose is not for tree huggers. Uh, I kind of put it in there because people often think that uh, when you talk about purpose, you talk about NGOs, or you talk about uh, nonprofits, or people that are only and merely idealistically motivated. I think everybody that's idealistically motivated will totally need purpose as well. But if you're um, a company, a commercial organization, you also need purpose. You also have a goal that you're aiming for. So it really needs to be pulled out of that realm of uh, just looking at uh, the NGOs. No, it's, it's applicable to every organization that tries to achieve whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. 
And in that sense, purpose is value agnostic. And that's, that's quite a good one to realize. Um, purpose doesn't say what direction purpose needs to aim in. That's really up to whomever organizes it, whoever defines that purpose. Um, to dive a bit more into that idea of, of competitive advantage by means of purpose, let's look at, uh, at, at commercial organizations and some of the struggles that they're facing. Today's workforce does not just want a job. People that are talented, they can be quite picky. And what are they choosing for? You know, they can get critical and look at what employers have to offer. More and more, um, you see a shift in what they're looking for. Same goes for consumers. They don't just want to buy a product. They don't just only care about price and quality anymore. There's a shift happening there. And what is that shift? They want to work towards a purpose. So people want to show up in an organization and not just get a good salary and do cool stuff, but they want to contribute to something that aligns with their values. Research shows that it is ever increasing and it's not stopping. Got some footnotes to figure out where I got that from. The same goes for consumers. I call about sustainable uh, products, but it's more about uh, products in general. People are more and more critical as to, hey, the people that provide me these products, how do they organize? What do I do? You see more and more examples of companies actually kind of having to realign and readjust uh, their, their, their marketing statements, but that's often reactive. So why don't we make it proactive? Why don't we start up front saying, hey, this is what we stand for, and everything in our organization directly contributes to it. So in my mind, for businesses, that means adapt or die. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of an exaggeration maybe, but it's, it really shows you need to be agile. You need to adapt. You need to be able to figure out uh, what it is you exist for in the first place and how to get there. Um, and that, that put dot on the horizon should always be the guiding item. And I'm going to go through a couple of uh, key concepts to outline how that works within Holacracy. Um, first, I want to touch upon uh, some of the similarities you find with, with Scrum and Agile. A uh, little bit of a disclaimer, I'm not a Scrum or an Agile expert, so I um, would love to hear some feedback from you guys where you see the overlap, uh, maybe in the questions area or uh, maybe afterwards. Responding to change over following a plan. <laughs> a manifesto, Agile manifesto, loving the, the last rule in there. Um, that really applies to holacracy as well. So. If you, if you can't do this, if you, if, you, if you can't respond to change and stick to a plan, um, then you're not agile enough. Then you, you can't adapt to the changes that are available in your, uh, in your surroundings. And the same goes if, uh, for, for Scrum, the idea of, of small iterations, small steps, continuously, all the time. It's really a key concept that you find in Holacracy as well. Um, but then not only for the work, but also on the structure of the organization. Now uh, that's, that's the big shift here. So I'll, I'll, I'll dive into what that means. How can you change the structure of your organization on an ongoing basis? A um, bit of a history, really simplistic history of the structures of organizations. You start with a centralized authority, one boss, 15 employees, he tells everybody what to do, and off you go. And then you have the industrial revolution, and organizations get too big, and then you need to actually delegate some of that authority and uh, have uh, middle management, higher management, depending on how big that organization are, is. Um, the paradigm shift we're currently talking about is a shift from delegated authority to distributed authority. Key point about uh, delegated authority is that you um, are given responsibility, but it can always be pulled back. If you screw up, it's going to be pulled back. So then you don't really have the full mandate to do, to do whatever it is that you feel you need to do within those roles. Distributed authority does not have central power. That's holacracy. It's a network organization. So um, there's still hierarchy. Don't get me wrong. It's not a flat organization. And I'll talk about that. But there's not a single point of power holder. And these dots, these dots are not people anymore. These dots are roles. And what that distinction means I'll show you in a second, but it's a very important distinction. It, it cuts back into what I said earlier. That split of people pull the people out of the organization. Organization in itself is an entity, 
that needs to be energized by people. But they are not the same thing. Key concept, default to yes and speed. Where, generally speaking, in an organization, uh, the bigger the organization, rule of thumb, the more risk averse they get. Uh, you probably all have a, a sense of that. You know, if you step into a big organization, you probably have to go through a couple of uh, uh, approval layers for, for specific things. In Holacracy, uh, that's really turned upside down. The default is do whatever you need to energize your role. Be an entrepreneur. Go as fast as you possibly can. The structure is there to make sure that you don't do irreparable damage to the organization. And this is, this is really cool. Once you start to get the hang of this, uh, you, you show up at work as an entrepreneur, um, getting really energized for whatever it is that you need to do, because you have full freedom and full mandate to do whatever it is that you need, as long as you don't violate somebody else's property. So that's the only catch, as long as you don't violate somebody else's property. And that you can also define that in Holacracy. There's a way to do that. Dive into that when I uh, walk you through some of the tool sets available in Holacracy. Level the playing field. What you um, find in organizations is because they're so intertwined with people that there is um, lots of uh, power structures between those people. And they have a lot to do with the different character traits that they show up at in the organization. Some people are loud, some people are a bit quieter, some people like to uh, try some things first, some are a little bit more hesitant to try something first. That all plays into who gets to make the decisions. Try to watch the dynamic of, of a meeting next week, or maybe you know, a retrospectively look back and figure out why did we decide what we decided? Was that because it was the best thing for the organization? Or was that because there was uh, some characteristics at play, somebody that just won the argument? That happens a lot in organizations. So what Holacracy does, it introduces a couple of rules and you specifically really see them in uh, the meetings to get rid of that. So you still, you're still your person, but sh when you show up in the organization, there is no room for the character to play either the, the overpowering role or the submissive role. You have to show up there and bring, your, bring whatever it is that that role needs, or you has also have to step back when it's not your role. There's all these, um, these rules in play to make sure that that happens. So it doesn't tell you don't, that you have to change to be a different person. It just says that person, those characteristics, don't show up in the organization and do not determine the purpose or the way that the organization expresses that purpose. Touched upon this before. Um, small and quick iterations, but I, it's, it's quite a key aspect because, um, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the, the, the governance records and the governance records in Holacracy are like the, uh, the organi organization structure, the old org chart, as you may will, but then a dynamic one that continuously changes, just like your, uh, your sprints or your, your scrum processes. Um, every single step of the way, you, you measure, you improve, you measure, improve, so that uh, your, both your governance records are up to date, really clear on who's accountable for what, but also your work really is in line with whatever it is that your context asks of that work. This is a, a nice analogy I like, um, to see it as a safety net. Because if everything goes swimmingly, if everything just goes like it should go, um, you shouldn't see holacracy. And if you do see holacracy, or you do feel holacracy pushing against you, it probably should. Because you're probably acting out of your role, you're probably doing something that's, that's not expected of you within those roles. Or you're sitting on somebody else's chair, or you're violating somebody's domain. But if, so if that goes wrong, Holacracy is there to make sure that it catches whatever has gone wrong. And if something is missed in a, in a, in a current day organization, nine out of 10 times, it's not actually missed. It's just that nothing could be done with the person that noticed it. And that's what Holacracy is about. So whomever notices anything can bring that to the table and transform that into meaningful change in line with the purpose of the organization. So that's a safety net. Make sure nothing falls through the cracks. But outside of that safety net, do whatever it is that you need. Go as fast as you possibly can. 
So how does Holacracy then do that? What are the tools we have available to us? Tensions. These are um, often when first uh, seen by people, when we talk about tensions, they have a negative association with them. In Holacracy, uh, they're neutral. They're a mere gap between reality and perceived reality. Like an example, um, server is down. That's the reality. Your perceived reality, it should be back up. Um, that's a tension that you need to act upon. Do it as swift as you can, uh, but it's, it's fuel for the organization. Um, another example, you're doing great. You've got a lot of sales, but you see a new client that you might land. Also tension, a gap between reality, perceived reality. Act upon it. Holacracy says every tension needs to be uh, transformed into meaningful change for the purpose of the organization. And any tension sensed by anyone, so there's no um, tension gatekeeper, or there's nobody that says, no, that's relevant and that's not relevant. No, everybody within their roles gets to decide what is relevant. And that's, that's quite key, because I, I'm pretty sure all of us will know, uh, we've, seen, we've seen opportunity in an organization you wanted to act upon that would make your, your work and, uh, and uh, your responsibilities um, work better and achieve more, but you couldn't because of X, bureaucracy, or uh, you didn't have the mandate, or whatever it is that might, might have been limiting you. Holacracy says no, act upon it, and act upon it swiftly. This is not the part of the toolbox of, um, of Holacracy, but it's a, it's a, it's a nice lead-in to the governance records. Um, I was kind of like it. This is like the, 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 the normal way that organizations are structured, right? You have your org chart, and there is the official org chart, and then there is the unofficial org chart. And that's what you see at play here. A question, how, how many of you have, uh, in the last week, used the org chart of your organization or your own job description to help you decide what you needed to do in your work? Well, I did. <laughs> Nice. Um, that usually that goes exactly in line with the people that also say they work in their Holacracy organization. <laughs> because uh, in Holacracy you use it every day, uh, but more often than not, most people have find this somewhat dormant. So not for everybody, there's exceptions. Uh, sometimes job titles can still give you some guidance, uh, but more often than not, they become still, and so does the org chart. So if the official org chart doesn't help the organization, how does it function? How does it figure out who's responsible for what? That's all these other lines. It's the life of the organization. So it's actually great that you have all these other relations, these interpersonal relations in the, the, the classical man uh, management hierarchy to make sure that the organization still gets something done because the official channels don't support it. But by definition, these are all interpersonal relationships. So by definition, they're based on personal tensions and personal needs, and not necessarily the best thing for the organization. So that's what Holacracy is all about, splitting that up and making the actual um, org chart useful again. And you might have heard about that uh, before, like I touched upon the, the governance records and, and what that looks like. There's a lot of talk in Holacracy about circles and roles. Uh, you can kind of see circles as teams, but there's one massive distinction Teams are usually around people. Circles in Holacracy is a collection of roles that, co that come together to achieve a purpose of that circle. And circles can be nested, so that's a hierarchy. And often when people think about Holacracy, there's, there's something said about the fact that it might be a flat management structure because they heard um, managers, it's a structure without managers and thus it must be flat. Uh, that's not true. Um, it's strongly hierarchical and with a strong reason, because there's a top purpose, but that purpose, when you sit at your desk, probably doesn't tell you exactly what to do when you sit at your desk. So it needs to be distilled down into sub-purposes by means of circles and sub-circles. And each role in these um, different circles has have their own purpose and their accountabilities. And that's the makeup of the org chart, which in uh, Holacracy is called the governance records. 
So those roles and those circles have their purpose and their accountabilities, which give a role and a circle guidance of what is expected of them. There's a couple of other parts to uh, the governance records to complete that, and they're more in the realm of um, restricting certain things. But by default, very little is restricted. But only if somebody has a tension around it, let's say the company credit card is uh, used too much, my credit card is a bad example, let's say the, the company car is used too much and there's only one role that should be able to use it, then they get the domain of the company car and that role can only use the car. Now that's, then you need to make explicit that that role is the owner of that specific object or service or whatever it might be. But by default, everything is open. And that really opens a huge realm of, uh, of possibilities. That means that every role filler can use whatever means available to them to energize that role and achieve the role's purpose, rather than ask permission for every single step along the way. How, what can a, a role look like? This is an example of uh, one of the roles that I actually fill. It's my product owner role, but it doesn't necessarily need to be related to Scrum. What you see here, the top, there's a, a purpose, capturing and defining kick-ass product uh, facilitating all purpose-driven organizations. Well, that gives me a point on the horizon uh, to aim for. Not static, can change over time. When I see this right, this, like right now, I think, no, that can be stronger. Might be tension, improve it next time around. Name of the, of the role and a couple of accountabilities. So capturing and defining stories from all relevant stakeholders can be expected from this role prioritizing stories for uh, product development and providing product development with, what did they say, um, clear and concise story definitions. Yeah. Cool. If I step into that role, I kind of know what's expected of me. I can start translating this purpose, these accountabilities, to the work that I need to do, and thus starting to contribute to the purpose of the organization as a whole. So note that from that, that abstract talk about uh, purpose-driven organizations that gets translated to very concrete role descriptions that do work. And that's, that's, the, the, that's the real big shift that you see happening here with Holacracy. It gives a framework for organizations to use regardless of what that organization is doing. So what, regardless of what industry that organization works in, they can use Holacracy to help them become purpose-driven and make sure they deliver upon that purpose effectively, efficiently. Another thing to note here, the structure, right? You can always find, figure out, hey, where does this role live? Where does this role live in, in the organization? And that's also just, that role only stays there. It doesn't fly out of there. You know, that's, that's where it belongs, so that hierarchy part is not to be ignored. And all that talk about um, governance records is all just there to facilitate the work. Because if, if you're just by yourself and you want to do your thing, that's fine. You know, do your thing. You, you might not need all those governance records. Like if you look at the story of um, getting things done, that's great for yourself. You can really get productive. You can really um, become purpose-driven for yourself as well. But it gets tricky when you put other people into play. And that's where Holacracy comes in. So I've also heard Holacracy described as getting things done for teams. It's actually the title of a book of a colleague of mine. Um, so the projects and the next actions, they are really in line with the getting the things done methodology. So Holacracy has really borrowed a lot of key concepts of, of systems that just work. Like getting things done, uh, ideas that come out of the, the agile scrum world, um, and some, some other methodologies that have been around, and build upon those to, uh, to further a very pragmatic and practical approach to towards becoming um, uh, purpose-driven. Transparency is a real key in this. So what you see here is just the, the project board of one specific role. Um, everybody can always see all the work that everybody is doing. You can just dive in there. And you need that. You, first of all, really need that for yourself. If you... Um, because in the end, organization is all around prioritizing. Most of us have a whole lot of work on our plate, uh, more than you can do in one day. So what is the most important? You can only figure out what is the most important if you have the full list of everything that you need to do and clear accountabilities on what you need to deliver on, compare those, and then pick the most important thing that has the highest impact. 
Um, and this is really where people start to feel uh, and see holacracy for the first time in the, uh, in the meetings. It's also really where the, um, a lot of the first pain gets experienced. Because we, when we implement holacracy, we don't um, give a theoretical talk and then uh, say, go do it. No, we, we just start to uh, play the game. And we start initially quite soon on with these meetings. And one key aspect of these meetings is that it splits out governance and operational meetings. Um, what happens a lot if you don't is this recursive loop in meetings, where you come into a meeting, we need to get something done. And then one of two things happens. Um, your team is either uh, going to look for consensus, what do you guys think, or um, somebody with the biggest mouth makes a call, and then people say, oh, maybe that's all right. But as soon as there's a conflict, you kind of often get stuck in a recursive loop. You can't get to the decision, and then you talk about who's responsible, and you get back to trying to figure out what the decision needs to be, and that's how you get stuck. And that happens so often. How often have you not had a meeting where the agenda was 10 items, you only got two items done, and only half a decision was made that nobody's happy with? And that's because of that unclarity. It's not clear who gets to decide. And that's why these governance records are so crucial. So you can really clearly lay out who gets to make the decision. That person can gather all the input that's needed, but they make the decision. The number of times I've seen discussions on JavaScript frameworks gone absolutely bonkers, um, it was just because nobody was clear on who made the final decision. And in Holoxy, everybody can have attention around it. Everybody can have an opinion about it and say, hey, from my role as developer, I cannot work with that JavaScript framework. I need to process that tension. Then you put a project with the person that's responsible for picking that JavaScript framework to solve the tension because they are accountable with it, for it. And you keep doing it until it is solved. So in those governance records, those governance meetings, you fix the governance records. And that's the only uh, point in time when governance records get updated or changed. And when you start it maybe every two weeks, uh, but you find your own heartbeat, often that ends up being once a month or something like that. So you have a governance meeting to update the governance record to get clarity on what roles are accountable for what. Um, those operational meetings, they're called tactical meetings, uh, they often happen weekly. And in Scrum, actually, often they, they, they tend to replace or uh, at least overlap a, a large amount with the retrospectives. Because a lot of retrospectives, if you think about it, are a lot around solving tensions. Technical does that as well. But whatever happens in the tactical meeting can also happen outside of the tactical meeting. So that's really just the placeholder to once a week come together, make sure that nothing falls through the cracks. Really important part of these uh, operational, these technical meetings is also metrics. It's really data driven. Well, actually really uh, make, sure, make sure that you get data to measure how well you're fulfilling your purpose. Because otherwise it's just some soft term you don't quite know. Now let's get data, figure out, quantify how well you're pursuing that purpose. And then when you see the trend and everybody sees the trend, it's going down, feel the tensions and process that. If that doesn't get processed, I'm sure that somebody higher up in the organization, a role higher up in the organization, will feel tension around that. And that needs to get processed. So there's still really strong tools available. Also, as um, conventional managers often find themselves in, in uh, roles a bit higher up in the, the hierarchy of the organization, responsible for um, things like, uh, like revenue, or responsible for assigning people to roles. There's a specific role for that in, in holacracy. And there's really strong tools available still to steer. The only thing that uh, has changed is that you do not get control over other people. And the other thing that changed is that everybody within their role gets to process their own tensions. And you do not get to say yes or no. And that often uh, happens in, in uh, modern um, or current day organizations. All of this um, comes together in the Constitution. And the Constitution is uh, a collection of all the holacracy rules on how it works. Um, by all means, flick through it, but if you're really interested in holacracy, I invite you to actually um, do a demo. There's, uh, there's uh, more and more uh, demos being given where you can just actually experience 
what it's like to be in a, uh, a meeting, like a governance meeting or a tactical meeting, and to really get a feel for what it's like and what it can bring you as an organization, but also what it can do for you as a person in an organization. Because the vast majority of people that have worked in, uh, in an organization using Holacracy um, feel, feel somewhat you know, caught after a while because they, they say, I cannot work anywhere else anymore. I cannot work in an organization that does not use Holacracy anymore. And because it's quite young, um, there's not so many options out there. Um, but there's, co there's more and more coming. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the choices of those people will, uh, will increase. But really, if you want to get started with Holacracy, do um, a taste sermon. By all means, uh, come to me after the meeting and uh, I can uh, share with you where you can have these tasters, where you can experience it. Uh, we also do some of that, but mostly in Holland. I'm not quite sure what the scene is like here in Moscow. Um, but if you're interested, there is ways to experience this. And that's really to get a feel for it. Hey, is this right uh, for our organization and can this help our organization? Um, having said that, um, I, I quickly want to get back to that, that initial story of the guy that really changed his working life around from something, I want to leave this company to, geez, I can do whatever. Um, I can really find myself, use my skills, and utilize these skills within this organization to uh, contribute to the purpose of this organization. Um, and I hope uh, to see some of you uh, with us on that path to more purpose-driven organizations um, over the, the next couple of years. So thank you very much, and I have some time for questions afterwards, I think. Cheers. I think there's a microphone going around, right? Uh, thank you for, very much for the presentation. I want to ask uh, who participated on those governance meetings? How, how you, uh, who decide uh, who will participate in them and how it happened? Thank you very much. Everybody that fills a role in the circle participates in the governance meeting for the circle. So every circle has their own governance meetings. Every, uh, every circle has their own governance meetings, and everybody that uh, fills a role in um, that circle participates in the governance meeting and can thus change the, um, the governance records for that circle. Okay, but uh, as far as I understood, um, th those meetings are also uh, for the, so how, how someone can get into the, uh, the person, not the role, but the person get into those meetings? How he, he can Good fill question. in the role? You, the roles are appointed. So uh, whenever a role, let's say we had a governance meeting right now and we created a new role. Um, and that role is empty because we just created it. There, every circle has, the, uh, has a role called a lead link with the, the clear accountability of assigning people to roles. So that lead link assigns people to roles. And that lead link in itself is appointed again from the higher circle. The lead link of the higher circle appoints lead links of the lower circle. Thank you for the presentation. Can you give us some inform materials or where to find them on Holacracy, like books or websites, whatever? Yeah, there's, there's, there's one uh, book I can give to you immediately. Uh, Brian Robertson, he's uh, the founder, co-founder of Holacracy One. And uh, he uh, um, brought, put Holacracy into the world, as you may say. Uh, Brian Robertson, he wrote a book. Uh, and I think it's just called Holacracy. Um, and it lays out all the all the key concepts. If you wanna if you wanna learn more, there's also a lot of a lot of videos online explaining exactly that, and a lot of them by the, by him, but also uh, more examples by by others. And if you if you know Dutch, there's also a Dutch book on holacracy, but I'm sure that the the audience of Dutch uh, speakers here is uh, fairly small. Yes. Thank you for presentation again. And if you were to recommend the best and smartest way to become a holacracy coach what it would be? Um, that is to follow the, the uh, practitioner course. There is a course that's given, I think, uh, maybe eight times a year or something along those lines. Uh, get started there. Uh, they're not necessarily cheap, but they're really good. Um, and that's a great way to get started. But I, what I said earlier, uh, maybe it's even better just to attend a one-day workshop to get a bit of a feel for it. Say, hey, is this something for me? And then if you like that, 
uh, you can go on to do uh, the, a week course that gets you really into the concepts, some of the concepts that are laid out here, but really the nitty gritty, how does it all work? And then from there, you can also do a coach training, uh, which is also a week, and then there's a coach assessment, and then you can be a coach. So there's, there's a couple of hoops to jump through uh, to get there, uh, but the, the trainings themselves are, are uh, definitely well worth it. Hi. Cool, and, then, and I can and talk a bit more about it. I think there's also another person here that done these trainings uh, in, in the room, so we can talk about him with him as well. Uh, hi, I'm here to the right. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Uh, so at the very beginning of your talk, there was a little experiment of awareness of hol holacracy you know, by, by the show of hands. Uh, why do you think so little number of organizations is using holacracy these days? Is it new, is it complicated, or what? It's new. Okay. It's really new. The, like on it's the it's only reason is new. Well, uh, I can't see, uh, it, like, I don't know for sure, but it's only been around, I think, for about seven years. And it's only really starting to gain traction over the last couple of years. Uh, just and also the mere fact that there's only I think maybe 50 or 60 holacracy coaches worldwide. Um, you know, it, it is it's really uh, for that respect it's bleeding edge, uh, really exciting stuff. Uh, but you need to be ready for it as well as an as an organization, and you need to also be ready for holacracy itself to evolve because that's also not stopping. Um, so it's new. Other questions? Yes. Можете сказать, где вот можно узнать информацию про вот эти вот тренинги, коучинги и прочее, где прокачаться вот можно физически? Can somebody help me? Um, yeah, it's where you can get some learning, uh, some trainings in holacracy, and where can you find information about these trainings? Uh, the, the holacracy one uh, dot org, I think it is. Um, that's the company uh, founded by Brian Robertson. They have a lot of information there. Um, but there's, I think there's also some other trainings, but they, they have most of them on their website and they also have all the holacracy providers on their website. So all companies that are providing these services of implementation and courses. Um, so that's a good resource to start to figure out, hey, who are the local providers? Are there some Russian providers? And if not, where am I the, the closest? I guess in Scrum Tech, they got someone who has passed this, uh, got some training. And a question from me, I would uh, ask you to share maybe some personal experience in consulting in organizations. What type of organizations, what industries have you um, met on your way and uh, who really do implement holacracy? Good, good From question. Your own experience, yeah. It's it's uh, the, the the exciting thing is that it's quite a broad spectrum. If you look at all the industries, but if you look at the um, um, the bulk, the biggest industry that I see uh, is at least in my work is is IT related. Um, so it's it's software development related. Like and often it's it's companies that that develop um, either an online service or or their own products. Um, and I think it is really tied to. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the Scrum and Agile has been around for so long and the whole idea of minimum viable, uh, small iterations, quick steps, and, and lots of autonomy, that's nothing new. But just bringing that to the next level, because that was also my, my own experience when I was working in Scrum and, and, and Agile, is that often you leave this really kick-ass team, but the problems are still there. They're just moved to another part of the organization. Now, how can you address that? And I know that within Agile and within Scrum, there's also alternatives there. Um, but I think that Holacracy offers an, uh, a really all-inclusive solution for that. That's not necessarily competing with Scrum in that sense. They can really work hand in hand. It really lives at a different level. In that sense, um, Holacracy is really an operating system. Um, I have a question about Holacracy Consulting. So, uh, you know, I have a facilitator cr credential and I try to sell Holacracy to a couple of companies. So uh, initially, people come, came to me because they wanted to solve some business problems, you know. But when you look at the, at, at the definition of holacracy and what it gives to you, it's not about problem solving, right? It offers something different. And hence, the, the question is, how do people even decide that, that they need holacracy? So as a consultant, what do I look for to yeah. sell it? So nice. Good, good, good question. Um, but the, 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 the common line that I see often for organizations that go this way are often younger organizations, actually tying into the, the, the question of the gentleman earlier, 
younger organizations that were the founders are, are still really there and it's younger successful organizations. So the founders, they got on their way, they're really good at what they do, and all of a sudden they find themselves managing an organization of 25, 30, 40 people, and they're not so passionate about that. They wanna get back into being uh, really good at what they do and not babysitting a whole lot of people, like quotes from people themselves. So organizations, the fast growing young organization with, with energetic uh, young founders, they often find their way to uh, to holacracy, they say, well, I don't want to be responsible. I've got all these skilled people. Why am I deciding about what they should be doing? They can do that themselves. So I think that's a, that's a good thing to go by. Hi, thank you for the great speech. Uh, in my practice, uh, I have seen some cases where there is a group of really motivated people, but with uh, different points of view on the problem solving and uh, they really want to solve the problem but they uh, see the purpose in a bit different ways and see different ways and uh, in that cases uh, I guess for in my cases uh, it caused more conflicts because there were no one hand who will say we will do this they're full of energy full of uh, enthusiasm but they can't find uh, single solution yeah. what would you recommend in that case well th 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 it's an interesting question and, and obviously the, um, the the specifics are a little bit beyond me uh, but what i hear is that there's a discussion about what should be done yes right um and that's a great discussion to have as long as there's clear accountability for one role filled by uh, by one person that can say cool thanks for all this input guys this is what we'll do and and the interesting thing to note there is that it's, um, that's going to frustrate people, and that's fine. Mm. Because it's not, you're, like, the organization is not there to serve the people, it's there to serve the purpose. So that frustration probably needs to be felt for a little bit, and then the people need to realize, okay, cool, not my role, I'll go back to my roles where I have my accountability, and I'm going to just kick ass there. So it should be the leader role. No, there's, there, there, there's no uh, leader role. Like in, in Holacracy, everybody is a leader um, in their own role. You have full accountability um, and full uh, authority in every role that you fill. So it's really about what I showed you, that role before. Does it, if a, a topic falls within your accountabilities, go with it. You're the one that's going to call that shot. You're going to go forward. And if somebody has another opinion or another idea, great. If you want to use that input, go for it. But it's not their call. So there's no single leader role, like when I talked about the lead link role, that lead link role is specifically not there to decide about content co conflicts. Because uh, if, if there's a content conflict, probably your governance records are out of date. Your governance records need more clarity so that you can figure out who's gonna call the shots on this problem. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Okay, then thanks, Just. Great talk. Thanks.